The Kiss by Anton Chekhov At 8 o'clock on the evening of the 20th of May all the six batteries of the N-Reserve Artillery Brigade halted for the night in the village of Maestechki on their way to camp. When the general commotion was at its height, while some officers were busily occupied around the guns, while others, gathered together in the square near the church enclosure, were listening to the quartermasters, a man in civilian dress, riding a strange horse, came into sight round the church. The little dun-colored horse with a good neck and a short tail came, moving not straight forward, but as it were sideways, with a sort of dance step, as though it were being lashed about the legs. When he reached the officers the man on the horse took off his hat and said, His Excellency Lieutenant General von Rabeck invites the gentleman to drink tea with him this minute. The horse turned, danced, and retired sideways, the messenger raised his hat once more, and in an instant disappeared with his strange horse behind the church. What the devil does it mean, grumbled some of the officers, dispersing to their quarters. One is sleepy, and hear this von Rabeck with his tea. We know what tea means. The officers of all the six batteries remembered vividly an incident of the previous year, when during maneuvers they, together with the officers of a Cossack regiment, were in the same way invited to tea by a count who had an estate in the neighborhood and was a retired army officer, the hospitable and genial count made much of them, fed them, and gave them drink, refused to let them go to their quarters in the village and made them stay the night. All that, of course, was very nice nothing better could be desired, but the worst of it was, the old army officer was so carried away by the pleasure of the young men's company that till sunrise he was telling the officers anecdotes of his glorious past, taking them over the house, showing them expensive pictures, old engravings, rare guns, reading them autograph letters from great people, while the weary and exhausted officers looked and listened, longing for their beds and yawning in their sleeves. When at last their host let them go, it was too late for sleep. Might not this von Rabeck be just such another? Whether he were or not, there was no help for it. The officers changed their uniforms, brushed themselves, and went all together in search of the gentleman's house. In the square by the church they were told they could get to His Excellency's by the lower path going down behind the church to the river, going along the bank to the garden, and there an avenue would take them to the house or by the upper way straight from the church by the road which, half a mile from the village, led right up to His Excellency's granaries. The officers decided to go by the upper way. What von Rabeck is it, they wondered on the way. Surely not the one who was in command of the N Cavalry Division at Plevna. No, that was not von Rabeck, but simply Rab and no von. What lovely weather! At the first of the granaries the road divided in two, one branch went straight on and vanished in the evening darkness, the other led to the owner's house on the right. The officers turned to the right and began to speak more softly. On both sides of the road stretched stone granaries with red roofs, heavy and sullen looking, very much like barracks of a district town. Ahead of them gleamed the windows of the manor house. A good omen, gentlemen, said one of the officers. Our setter is the foremost of all. No doubt he scents game ahead of us. Lieutenant Lobitko, who was walking in front, a tall and stalwart fellow, though entirely without mustache, he was over five and twenty, yet for some reason there was no sign of hair on his round, well-fed face, renowned in the brigade for his peculiar faculty for divining the presence of women at a distance, turned round and said. Yes, there must be women here, I feel that by instinct. On the threshold the officers were met by von Rabeck himself, a comely-looking man of sixty in civilian dress. Shaking hands with his guests, he said that he was very glad and happy to see them, but begged them earnestly for God's sake to excuse him for not asking them to stay the night, two sisters with their children, some brothers and some neighbors, had come on a visit to him, so that he had not one spare room left. The general shook hands with everyone, made his apologies, and smiled, but it was evident by his face that he was by no means so delighted as their last year's count, and that he had invited the officers simply because, in his opinion, it was a social obligation to do so. And the officers themselves, as they walked up the softly carpeted stairs, as they listened to him, 
felt that they had been invited to this house simply because it would have been awkward not to invite them, and at the sight of the footman, who hastened to light the lamps in the entrance below and in the anteroom above, they began to feel as though they had brought uneasiness and discomfort into the house with them. In a house in which two sisters and their children, brothers and neighbors were gathered together, probably on account of some family festivity, or event, how could the presence of nineteen unknown officers possibly be welcome? At the entrance to the drawing room the officers were met by a tall, graceful old lady with black eyebrows and a long face, very much like the Empress Eugenie. Smiling graciously and majestically, she said she was glad and happy to see her guests, and apologized that her husband and she were on this occasion unable to invite Messrs. Le Offi Sears to stay the night. From her beautiful majestic smile, which instantly vanished from her face every time she turned away from her guests, it was evident that she had seen numbers of officers in her day, that she was in no humor for them now, and if she invited them to her house and apologized for not doing more, it was only because her breeding and position in society required it of her. When the officers went into the big dining room, there were about a dozen people, men and ladies, young and old, sitting at tea at the end of a long table. A group of men was dimly visible behind their chairs, wrapped in a haze of cigar smoke, and in the midst of them stood a lanky young man with red whiskers, talking loudly, with a lisp, in English. Through a door beyond the group could be seen a light room with pale blue furniture. Gentlemen, there are so many of you that it is impossible to introduce you all, said the general in a loud voice, trying to sound very cheerful. Make each other's acquaintance, gentlemen, without any ceremony. The officers some with very serious and even stern faces, others with forced smiles, and all feeling extremely awkward somehow made their bows and sat down to tea. The most ill at ease of them all was Ryabovich a little officer in spectacles, with sloping shoulders, and whiskers like a lynx's. While some of his comrades assumed a serious expression, while others wore forced smiles, his face, his lynx-like whiskers, and spectacles seemed to say, I am the shyest, most modest, and most undistinguished officer in the whole brigade. At first, on going into the room and sitting down to the table, he could not fix his attention on any one face or object. The faces, the dresses, the cut glass decanters of brandy, the steam from the glasses, the molded cornices all blended in one general impression that inspired in Ryabovich alarm and a desire to hide his head. Like a lecturer making his first appearance before the public, he saw everything that was before his eyes, but apparently only had a dim understanding of it. Among physiologists this condition, when the subject sees but does not understand, is called psychical blindness. After a little while, growing accustomed to his surroundings, Ryabovich saw clearly and began to observe. As a shy man, unused to society, what struck him first was that in which he had always been deficient namely, the extraordinary boldness of his new acquaintances. Von Rabeck, his wife, two elderly ladies, a young lady in a lilac dress, and the young man with the red whiskers, who was, it appeared, a younger son of von Rabeck, very cleverly, as though they had rehearsed it beforehand, took seats between the officers, and at once got up a heated discussion in which the visitors could not help taking part. The lilac young lady hotly asserted that the artillery had a much better time than the cavalry and the infantry, while von Rabeck and the elderly ladies maintained the opposite. A brisk interchange of talk followed. Ryabovich watched the lilac young lady who argued so hotly about what was unfamiliar and utterly uninteresting to her, and watched artificial smiles come and go on her face. Von Rabeck and his family skillfully drew the officers into the discussion, and meanwhile kept a sharp lookout over their glasses and mouths, to see whether all of them were drinking, whether all had enough sugar, why someone was not eating cakes or not drinking brandy. And the longer Ryabovich watched and listened, the more he was attracted by this insincere but splendidly disciplined family. After tea the officers went into the drawing room. Lieutenant Lobitko's instinct had not deceived him. There were a great number of girls and young married ladies. The setter lieutenant was soon standing by a very young, fair girl in a black dress, and, bending down to her jauntily, as though leaning on an unseen sword, smiled and shrugged his shoulders coquettishly. 
He probably talked very interesting nonsense, for the fair girl looked at his well-fed face condescendingly and asked indifferently, really? And from that uninterested really, the setter, had he been intelligent, might have concluded that she would never call him to heel. The piano struck up, the melancholy strains of a valse floated out of the wide open windows, and everyone, for some reason, remembered that it was spring, a May evening. Everyone was conscious of the fragrance of roses, of lilac, and of the young leaves of the poplar. Ryabovich, in whom the brandy he had drunk made itself felt, under the influence of the music stole a glance towards the window, smiled, and began watching the movements of the women, and it seemed to him that the smell of roses, of poplars and lilac came not from the garden, but from the ladies' faces and dresses. Von Rabeck's son invited a scraggy-looking young lady to dance, and waltzed round the room twice with her. Lubitko, gliding over the parquet floor, flew up to the lilac young lady and whirled her away. Dancing began. Ryabovich stood near the door among those who were not dancing and looked on. He had never once danced in his whole life, and he had never once in his life put his arm round the waist of a respectable woman. He was highly delighted that a man should in the sight of all take a girl he did not know round the waist and offer her his shoulder to put her hand on, but he could not imagine himself in the position of such a man. There were times when he envied the boldness and swagger of his companions and was inwardly wretched, the consciousness that he was timid, that he was round-shouldered and uninteresting, that he had a long waist and lynx-like whiskers, had deeply mortified him, but with years he had grown used to this feeling, and now, looking at his comrades dancing or loudly talking, he no longer envied them, but only felt touched and mournful. When the quadrille began, young von Rabeck came up to those who were not dancing and invited two officers to have a game at billiards. The officers accepted and went with him out of the drawing room. Ryabovich, having nothing to do and wishing to take part in the general movement, slouched after them. From the big drawing room they went into the little drawing room, then into a narrow corridor with a glass roof, and thence into a room in which on their entrance three sleepy-looking footmen jumped up quickly from the sofa. At last, after passing through a long succession of rooms, young von Rabeck and the officers came into a small room where there was a billiard table. They began to play. Ryabovich, who had never played any game but cards, stood near the billiard table and looked indifferently at the players, while they in unbuttoned coats, with cues in their hands, stepped about, made puns, and kept shouting out unintelligible words. The players took no notice of him, and only now and then one of them, shoving him with his elbow or accidentally touching him with the end of his cue, would turn round and say pardon. Before the first game was over he was weary of it, and began to feel he was not wanted and in the way. He felt disposed to return to the drawing room, and he went out. On his way back he met with a little adventure. When he had gone halfway he noticed he had taken a wrong turning. He distinctly remembered that he ought to meet three sleepy footmen on his way, but he had passed five or six rooms, and those sleepy figures seemed to have vanished into the earth. Noticing his mistake, he walked back a little way and turned to the right, he found himself in a little dark room which he had not seen on his way to the billiard room. After standing there a little while, he resolutely opened the first door that met his eyes and walked into an absolutely dark room. Straight in front could be seen the crack in the doorway through which there was a gleam of vivid light, from the other side of the door came the muffled sound of a melancholy mazurka. Here, too, as in the drawing room, the windows were wide open and there was a smell of poplars, lilac and roses. Ryabovich stood still in hesitation. At that moment, to his surprise, he heard hurried footsteps and the rustling of a dress, a breathless feminine voice whispered at last. And two soft, fragrant, unmistakably feminine arms were clasped about his neck, a warm cheek was pressed to his cheek, and simultaneously there was the sound of a kiss. But at once the bestower of the kiss uttered a faint shriek and skipped back from him, as it seemed to Ryabovich, with aversion. He, too, almost shrieked and rushed towards the gleam of light at the door. When he went back into the drawing room his heart was beating and his hands were trembling so noticeably that he made haste to hide them behind his back. 
At first he was tormented by shame and dread that the whole drawing room knew that he had just been kissed and embraced by a woman. He shrank into himself and looked uneasily about him, but as he became convinced that people were dancing and talking as calmly as ever, he gave himself up entirely to the new sensation which he had never experienced before in his life. Something strange was happening to him. His neck, round which soft, fragrant arms had so lately been clasped, seemed to him to be anointed with oil, on his left cheek near his moustache where the unknown had kissed him there was a faint chilly tingling sensation as from peppermint drops, and the more he rubbed the place the more distinct was the chilly sensation, all over, from head to foot, he was full of a strange new feeling which grew stronger and stronger. He wanted to dance, to talk, to run into the garden, to laugh aloud. He quite forgot that he was round-shouldered and uninteresting, that he had lynx-like whiskers and an undistinguished appearance, that was how his appearance had been described by some ladies whose conversation he had accidentally overheard. When von Rabeck's wife happened to pass by him, he gave her such a broad and friendly smile that she stood still and looked at him inquiringly. I like your house immensely, he said, setting his spectacles straight. The general's wife smiled and said that the house had belonged to her father, then she asked whether his parents were living, whether he had long been in the army, why he was so thin, and so on. After receiving answers to her questions, she went on, and after his conversation with her his smiles were more friendly than ever, and he thought he was surrounded by splendid people. At supper Ryabovich ate mechanically everything offered him, drank, and without listening to anything, tried to understand what had just happened to him. The adventure was of a mysterious and romantic character, but it was not difficult to explain it. No doubt some girl or young married lady had arranged a tryst with someone in the dark room, had waited a long time, and being nervous and excited had taken Ryabovich for her hero, this was the more probable as Ryabovich had stood still hesitating in the dark room, so that he, too, had seemed like a person expecting something. This was how Ryabovich explained to himself the kiss he had received. And who is she, he wondered, looking round at the women's faces. She must be young, for elderly ladies don't give rendezvous. That she was a lady, one could tell by the rustle of her dress, her perfume, her voice. His eyes rested on the lilac young lady, and he thought her very attractive, she had beautiful shoulders and arms, a clever face, and a delightful voice. Ryabovich, looking at her, hoped that she and no one else was his unknown. But she laughed somehow artificially and wrinkled up her long nose, which seemed to him to make her look old. Then he turned his eyes upon the fair girl in a black dress. She was younger, simpler, and more genuine, had a charming brow, and drank very daintily out of her wine glass. Ryabovich now hoped that it was she. But soon he began to think her face flat and fixed his eyes upon the one next her. It's difficult to guess, he thought, musing. If one takes the shoulders and arms of the lilac one only, adds the brow of the fair one and the eyes of the one on the left of Lobitko, then. He made a combination of these things in his mind and so formed the image of the girl who had kissed him, the image that he wanted her to have, but could not find at the table. After supper, replete and exhilarated, the officers began to take leave and say thank you. Von Rabeck and his wife began again apologizing that they could not ask them to stay the night. Very, very glad to have met you, gentlemen, said Von Rabeck, and this time sincerely, probably because people are far more sincere and good-humored at speeding their parting guests than on meeting them. Delighted. I hope you will come on your way back. Don't stand on ceremony. Where are you going? Do you want to go by the upper way? No, go across the garden, it's nearer here by the lower way. The officers went out into the garden. After the bright light and the noise the garden seemed very dark and quiet. They walked in silence all the way to the gate. They were a little drunk, pleased, and in good spirits, but the darkness and silence made them thoughtful for a minute. Probably the same idea occurred to each one of them as to Ryabovich. Would there ever come a time for them when, like von Rabeck, they would have a large house, a family, a garden when they, too, would be able to welcome people, even though insincerely, feed them, 
make them drunk and contented? Going out of the garden gate, they all began talking at once and laughing loudly about nothing. They were walking now along the little path that led down to the river, and then ran along the water's edge, winding round the bushes on the bank, the pools and the willows that overhung the water. The bank and the path were scarcely visible, and the other bank was entirely plunged in darkness. Stars were reflected here and there on the dark water, they quivered and were broken up on the surface and from that alone it could be seen that the river was flowing rapidly. It was still. Drowsy curlews cried plaintively on the further bank, and in one of the bushes on the nearest side a nightingale was trilling loudly, taking no notice of the crowd of officers. The officers stood round the bush, touched it, but the nightingale went on singing. What a fellow, they exclaimed approvingly. We stand beside him and he takes not a bit of notice. What a rascal! At the end of the way the path went uphill, and, skirting the church enclosure, turned into the road. Here the officers, tired with walking uphill, sat down and lighted their cigarettes. On the other side of the river a murky red fire came into sight, and having nothing better to do, they spent a long time in discussing whether it was a campfire or a light in a window, or something else. Ryabovich, too, looked at the light, and he fancied that the light looked and winked at him, as though it knew about the kiss. On reaching his quarters, Ryabovich undressed as quickly as possible and got into bed. Lobitko and Lieutenant Meritlyakov a peaceable, silent fellow, who was considered in his own circle a highly educated officer, and was always, whenever it was possible, reading the Avistnik Evropi which he carried about with him everywhere were quartered in the same hut with Ryabovich. Lobitko undressed, walked up and down the room for a long while with the air of a man who has not been satisfied, and sent his orderly for beer. Meritlyakov got into bed, put a candle by his pillow and plunged into reading the Avistnik Evropi. Who was she? Ryabovich wondered, looking at the smoky ceiling. His neck still felt as though he had been anointed with oil and there was still the chilly sensation near his mouth as though from peppermint drops. The shoulders and arms of the young lady in lilac, the brow and the truthful eyes of the fair girl in black, waists, dresses, and brooches, floated through his imagination. He tried to fix his attention on these images, but they danced about, broke up and flickered. When these images vanished altogether from the broad dark background which every man sees when he closes his eyes, he began to hear hurried footsteps, the rustle of skirts, the sound of a kiss and an intense groundless joy took possession of him. Abandoning himself to this joy, he heard the orderly return and announce that there was no beer. Lobitko was terribly indignant, and began pacing up and down again. Well, isn't he an idiot, he kept saying, stopping first before Ryabovich and then before Meritlyakov. What a fool and a dummy a man must be not to get hold of any beer. Eh? Isn't he a scoundrel? Of course you can't get beer here, said Meritlyakov, not removing his eyes from the Avistnik Evropi. Oh. Is that your opinion? Lobitko persisted. Lord have mercy upon us, if you dropped me on the moon I'd find you beer and women directly. I'll go and find some at once. You may call me an imposter if I don't. He spent a long time in dressing and pulling on his high boots, then finished smoking his cigarette in silence and went out. Rabek, Grabek, Labek, he muttered, stopping in the outer room. I don't care to go alone, damn it all. Ryabovich, wouldn't you like to go for a walk? At eh. Receiving no answer, he returned, slowly undressed and got into bed. Meritlyakov sighed, put the Avistnik Evropi away, and put out the light. Hmm. Muttered Lobitko, lighting a cigarette in the dark. Ryabovich pulled the bedclothes over his head, curled himself up in bed, and tried to gather together the floating images in his mind and to combine them into one whole. But nothing came of it. He soon fell asleep, and his last thought was that someone had caressed him and made him happy that something extraordinary, foolish, but joyful and delightful, had come into his life. The thought did not leave him even in his sleep. When he woke up the sensations of oil on his neck and the chill of peppermint about his lips had gone, 
but joy flooded his heart just as the day before. He looked enthusiastically at the window frames, gilded by the light of the rising sun, and listened to the movement of the passers-by in the street. People were talking loudly close to the window. Lebedetsky, the commander of Ryabovich's battery, who had only just overtaken the brigade, was talking to his sergeant at the top of his voice, being always accustomed to shout. What else? shouted the commander. When they were shooing yesterday, your high nobility, they drove a nail into Pigeon's hoof. The vet. Put on clay and vinegar, they are leading him apart now. And also, your honor, Artemyev got drunk yesterday, and the lieutenant ordered him to be put in the limber of a spare gun carriage. The sergeant reported that Karpov had forgotten the new cords for the trumpets and the rings for the tents, and that their honors, the officers, had spent the previous evening visiting General von Rabeck. In the middle of this conversation the red-bearded face of Lebedetsky appeared in the window. He screwed up his short-sighted eyes, looking at the sleepy faces of the officers, and said good morning to them. Is everything all right? he asked. One of the horses has a sore neck from the new collar, answered Lebitko, yawning. The commander sighed, thought a moment, and said in a loud voice. I am thinking of going to see Alexandra Yevgrafovna. I must call on her. Well, goodbye. I shall catch you up in the evening. A quarter of an hour later the brigade set off on its way. When it was moving along the road by the granaries, Ryabovich looked at the house on the right. The blinds were down in all the windows. Evidently the household was still asleep. The one who had kissed Ryabovich the day before was asleep, too. He tried to imagine her asleep. The wide open windows of the bedroom, the green branches peeping in, the morning freshness, the scent of the poplars, lilac, and roses, the bed, a chair, and on it the skirts that had rustled the day before, the little slippers, the little watch on the table all this he pictured to himself clearly and distinctly, but the features of the face, the sweet sleepy smile, just what was characteristic and important, slipped through his imagination like quicksilver through the fingers. When he had ridden on half a mile, he looked back, the yellow church, the house and the river, were all bathed in light, the river with its bright green banks, with the blue sky reflected in it and glints of silver in the sunshine here and there, was very beautiful. Ryabovich gazed for the last time at Majestechki, and he felt as sad as though he were parting with something very near and dear to him. And before him on the road lay nothing but long familiar, uninteresting pictures. To right and to left, fields of young rye and buckwheat with rooks hopping about in them. If one looked ahead, one saw dust and the backs of men's heads, if one looked back, one saw the same dust and faces. Foremost of all marched four men with sabres this was the vanguard. Next, behind, the crowd of singers, and behind them the trumpeters on horseback. The vanguard and the chorus of singers, like torchbearers in a funeral procession, often forgot to keep the regulation distance and pushed a long way ahead. Ryabovich was with the first cannon of the 5th Battery. He could see all the four batteries moving in front of him. For anyone not a military man this long tedious procession of a moving brigade seems an intricate and unintelligible muddle, one cannot understand why there are so many people round one cannon, and why it is drawn by so many horses in such a strange network of harness, as though it really were so terrible and heavy. To Ryabovich it was all perfectly comprehensible and therefore uninteresting. He had known for ever so long why at the head of each battery there rode a stalwart bombardier, and why he was called a bombardier, immediately behind this bombardier could be seen the horsemen of the first and then of the middle units. Ryabovich knew that the horses on which they rode, those on the left, were called one name, while those on the right were called another it was extremely uninteresting. Behind the horsemen came two shaft horses. On one of them sat a rider with the dust of yesterday on his back and a clumsy and funny-looking piece of wood on his leg. Ryabovich knew the object of this piece of wood, and did not think it funny. All the riders waved their whips mechanically and shouted from time to time. The cannon itself was ugly. On the forepart lay sacks of oats covered with canvas, 
and the cannon itself was hung all over with kettles, soldiers' knapsacks, bags, and looked like some small harmless animal surrounded for some unknown reason by men and horses. To the leeward of it marched six men, the gunners, swinging their arms. After the cannon there came again more bombardiers, riders, shaft horses, and behind them another cannon, as ugly and unimpressive as the first. After the second followed a third, a fourth, near the fourth an officer, and so on. There were six batteries in all in the brigade, and four cannons in each battery. The procession covered half a mile, it ended in a string of wagons near which an extremely attractive creature the ass, Magar, brought by a battery commander from Turkey paced pensively with his long-eared head drooping. Ryabovich looked indifferently before and behind, at the backs of heads and at faces, at any other time he would have been half asleep, but now he was entirely absorbed in his new agreeable thoughts. At first when the brigade was setting off on the march he tried to persuade himself that the incident of the kiss could only be interesting as a mysterious little adventure, that it was in reality trivial, and to think of it seriously, to say the least of it, was stupid, but now he bade farewell to logic and gave himself up to dreams. At one moment he imagined himself in von Rabeck's drawing room beside a girl who was like the young lady in lilac and the fair girl in black, then he would close his eyes and see himself with another, entirely unknown girl, whose features were very vague. In his imagination he talked, caressed her, leaned on her shoulder, pictured war, separation, then meeting again, supper with his wife, children. Breaks on. The word of command rang out every time they went downhill. He, too, shouted brakes on, and was afraid this shout would disturb his reverie and bring him back to reality. As they passed by some landowner's estate Ryabovich looked over the fence into the garden. A long avenue, straight as a ruler, strewn with yellow sand and bordered with young birch trees, met his eyes. With the eagerness of a man given up to dreaming, he pictured to himself little feminine feet tripping along yellow sand, and quite unexpectedly had a clear vision in his imagination of the girl who had kissed him and whom he had succeeded in picturing to himself the evening before at supper. This image remained in his brain and did not desert him again. At midday there was a shout in the rear near the string of wagons. Easy. Eyes to the left. Officers. The general of the brigade drove by in a carriage with a pair of white horses. He stopped near the second battery, and shouted something which no one understood. Several officers, among them Ryabovich, galloped up to them. Well, asked the general, blinking his red eyes. Are there any sick? Receiving an answer, the general, a little skinny man, chewed, thought for a moment and said, addressing one of the officers. One of your drivers of the third cannon has taken off his leg guard and hung it on the fore part of the cannon, the rascal. Reprimand him. He raised his eyes to Ryabovich and went on. It seems to me your front strap is too long. Making a few other tedious remarks, the general looked at Lobitko and grinned. You look very melancholy today, Lieutenant Lobitko, he said. Are you pining for Madame Lopohov? Eh? Gentlemen, he is pining for Madame Lopohov. The lady in question was a very stout and tall person who had long passed her fortieth year. The general, who had a predilection for solid ladies, whatever their ages, suspected a similar taste in his officers. The officers smiled respectfully. The general, delighted at having said something very amusing and biting, laughed loudly, touched his coachman's back, and saluted. The carriage rolled on. All I am dreaming about now which seems to me so impossible and unearthly is really quite an ordinary thing, thought Ryabovich, looking at the clouds of dust racing after the general's carriage. It's all very ordinary, and everyone goes through it. That general, for instance, has once been in love, now he is married and has children. Captain Vodder, too, is married and beloved, though the nape of his neck is very red and ugly and he has no waist. Salvernanov is coarse and very totter, but he has had a love affair that has ended in marriage. I am the same as everyone else, and I, too, shall have the same experience as everyone else, sooner or later. And the thought that he was an ordinary person, and that his life was ordinary,
delighted him and gave him courage. He pictured her and his happiness as he pleased, and put no rein on his imagination. When the brigade reached their halting place in the evening, and the officers were resting in their tents, Ryabovich, Mertlyakov and Lobitko were sitting round a box having supper. Mertlyakov ate without haste, and, as he munched deliberately, read the Avistnik Evropi, which he held on his knees. Lobitko talked incessantly and kept filling up his glass with beer, and Ryabovich, whose head was confused from dreaming all day long, drank and said nothing. After three glasses he got a little drunk, felt weak, and had an irresistible desire to impart his new sensations to his comrades. A strange thing happened to me at those von Rabecks, he began, trying to put an indifferent and ironical tone into his voice. You know I went into the billiard room. He began describing very minutely the incident of the kiss, and a moment later relapsed into silence. In the course of that moment he had told everything, and it surprised him dreadfully to find how short a time it took him to tell it. He had imagined that he could have been telling the story of the kiss till next morning. Listening to him, Lobitko, who was a great liar and consequently believed no one, looked at him skeptically and laughed. Mertlyakov twitched his eyebrows and, without removing his eyes from the Avistnik Evropi, said. That's an odd thing. How strange. Throws herself on a man's neck, without addressing him by name. She must be some sort of hysterical neurotic. Yes, she must, Ryabovich agreed. A similar thing once happened to me, said Lobitko, assuming a scared expression. I was going last year to Kovna. I took a second-class ticket. The train was crammed, and it was impossible to sleep. I gave the guard half a ruble, he took my luggage and led me to another compartment. I lay down and covered myself with a rug. It was dark, you understand. Suddenly I felt someone touch me on the shoulder and breathe in my face. I made a movement with my hand and felt somebody's elbow. I opened my eyes and only imagine a woman. Black eyes, lips red as a prime salmon, nostrils breathing passionately a bosom like a buffer. Excuse me, Mertlyakov interrupted calmly, I understand about the bosom, but how could you see the lips if it was dark? Lobitko began trying to put himself right and laughing at Mertlyakov's unimaginativeness. It made Ryabovich win C.E. He walked away from the box, got into bed, and vowed never to confide again. Camp life began. The days flowed by, one very much like another. All those days Ryabovich felt, thought and behaved as though he were in love. Every morning when his orderly handed him water to wash with, and he sluiced his head with cold water, he thought there was something warm and delightful in his life. In the evenings when his comrades began talking of love and women, he would listen, and draw up closer and he wore the expression of a soldier when he hears the description of a battle in which he has taken part. And on the evenings when the officers, out on the spree with the setter Lobitko at their head, made Don Juan excursions to the suburb, and Ryabovich took part in such excursions, he always was sad, felt profoundly guilty, and inwardly begged her forgiveness. In hours of leisure or on sleepless nights, when he felt moved to recall his childhood, his father and mother everything near and dear, in fact, he invariably thought of Maestechki, the strange horse, von Rabeck, his wife who was like the Empress Eugenie, the dark room, the crack of light at the door. On the 31st of August he went back from the camp, not with the whole brigade, but with only two batteries of it. He was dreaming and excited all the way, as though he were going back to his native place. He had an intense longing to see again the strange horse, the church, the insincere family of the von Rabecks, the dark room. The inner voice, which so often deceives lovers, whispered to him for some reason that he would be sure to see her, and he was tortured by the questions, how he should meet her. What he would talk to her about. Whether she had forgotten the kiss. If the worst came to the worst, he thought, even if he did not meet her, it would be a pleasure to him merely to go through the dark room and recall the past. Towards evening there appeared on the horizon the familiar church and white granaries. Ryabovich's heart beat. He did not hear the officer who was riding beside him and saying something to him, 
he forgot everything, and looked eagerly at the river shining in the distance, at the roof of the house, at the dovecot round which the pigeons were circling in the light of the setting sun. When they reached the church and were listening to the billeting orders, he expected every second that a man on horseback would come round the church enclosure and invite the officers to tea, but, the billeting orders were read, the officers were in haste to go on to the village, and the man on horseback did not appear. Von Rabeck will hear at once from the peasants that we have come and will send for us, thought Ryabovich, as he went into the hut, unable to understand why a comrade was lighting a candle and why the orderlies were hurriedly setting samovars. A painful uneasiness took possession of him. He lay down, then got up and looked out of the window to see whether the messenger were coming. But there was no sign of him. He lay down again, but half an hour later he got up, and, unable to restrain his uneasiness, went into the street and strode towards the church. It was dark and deserted in the square near the church. Three soldiers were standing silent in a row where the road began to go downhill. Seeing Ryabovich, they roused themselves and saluted. He returned the salute and began to go down the familiar path. On the further side of the river the whole sky was flooded with crimson, the moon was rising, two peasant women, talking loudly, were picking cabbage in the kitchen garden, behind the kitchen garden there were some dark huts. And everything on the near side of the river was just as it had been in May, the path, the bushes, the willows overhanging the water, but there was no sound of the brave nightingale, and no scent of poplar and fresh grass. Reaching the garden, Ryabovich looked in at the gate. The garden was dark and still. He could see nothing but the white stems of the nearest birch trees and a little bit of the avenue, all the rest melted together into a dark blur. Ryabovich looked and listened eagerly, but after waiting for a quarter of an hour without hearing a sound or catching a glimpse of a light, he trudged back. He went down to the river. The general's bathhouse and the bath sheets on the rail of the little bridge showed white before him. He went on to the bridge, stood a little, and, quite unnecessarily, touched the sheets. They felt rough and cold. He looked down at the water. The river ran rapidly and with a faintly audible gurgle round the piles of the bathhouse. The red moon was reflected near the left bank, little ripples ran over the reflection, stretching it out, breaking it into bits, and seemed trying to carry it away. How stupid, how stupid, thought Ryabovich, looking at the running water. How unintelligent it all is. Now that he expected nothing, the incident of the kiss, his impatience, his vague hopes and disappointment, presented themselves in a clear light. It no longer seemed to him strange that he had not seen the general's messenger and that he would never see the girl who had accidentally kissed him instead of someone else, on the contrary, it would have been strange if he had seen her. The water was running, he knew not where or why, just as it did in May. In May it had flowed into the great river, from the great river into the sea, then it had risen in vapor, turned into rain, and perhaps the very same water was running now before Ryabovich's eyes again. What for? Why? And the whole world, the whole of life, seemed to Ryabovich an unintelligible, aimless jest. And turning his eyes from the water and looking at the sky, he remembered again how fate in the person of an unknown woman had by chance caressed him, he remembered his summer dreams and fancies, and his life struck him as extraordinarily meager, poverty-stricken, and colorless. When he went back to his hut he did not find one of his comrades. The orderly informed him that they had all gone to General von Rabeck's, who had sent a messenger on horseback to invite them. For an instant there was a flash of joy in Ryabovich's heart, but he quenched it at once, got into bed, and in his wrath with his fate, as though to spite it, did not go to the generals. The End Here's a summary of Anton Chekhov's short story The Kiss. The Kiss by Anton Chekhov tells the story of a young, provincial military officer named Ryabovich. He leads a rather uneventful life in a small town but is well regarded by his superiors and is considered a respectable man. One day, Ryabovich is invited to a party hosted by the Zolotanasha sisters, known for their beauty and charm. At the party, he meets Olga, one of the sisters, and is immediately captivated by her beauty and grace. As the evening progresses, 
Ryabovich and Olga engage in flirtatious behavior, and it becomes clear that there is a mutual attraction between them. In the days that follow, Ryabovich becomes obsessed with thoughts of Olga and their passionate encounter. He is infatuated with her and is unable to focus on his work or daily life. However, his world is shattered when he receives a letter from Olga in which she expresses her regret over their behavior at the party and asks him to forget their encounter. Ryabovich is devastated by this rejection and falls into a deep depression. The kiss explores themes of infatuation, desire, and the consequences of impulsive actions. It also delves into the idea of societal expectations and the clash between personal desires and societal norms. The story is known for its psychological depth and Chekhov's keen insight into the human psyche. Ultimately, The Kiss presents a complex portrayal of human emotions and relationships, leaving readers to contemplate the complexities of desire, attraction, and the unpredictability of human behavior. Here are the key learning points from Anton Chekhov's short story The Kiss. 1. The Allure of Desire The Kiss explores the powerful force of desire and infatuation. Ryabovich's intense attraction to Olga drives the narrative, illustrating how desire can consume an individual's thoughts and emotions. 2. Societal Expectations versus Personal Desires The story examines the tension between societal expectations and personal desires. Ryabovich's pursuit of Olga, despite her being married, challenges conventional norms and raises questions about the conflict between societal conventions and individual passions. 3. The Fragility of Self-Esteem Ryabovich's emotional turmoil after receiving Olga's rejection letter highlights the fragility of self-esteem and the profound impact of rejection on one's self-worth. It underscores the vulnerability of human emotions. 4. Complexity of Human Psychology The Kiss delves into the intricacies of human psychology. It portrays the unpredictability of human behavior, especially when driven by strong emotions, and offers a glimpse into the complexities of love, attraction, and emotional responses. 5. Reflection on the Consequences of Actions The story serves as a cautionary tale about the consequences of impulsive actions driven by desire. Ryabovich's infatuation and pursuit of Olga lead to emotional distress and inner turmoil, serving as a reminder of the potential pitfalls of heedless behavior. 6. Exploration of Melancholy and Regret Chekhov's narrative style often delves into the realm of melancholy and regret. In The Kiss, the melancholic tone pervades the story, leaving readers with a sense of the fleeting nature of intense emotions and passionate encounters. 7. Character Development The protagonist, Ryabovich, undergoes significant character development throughout the story. His infatuation with Olga and subsequent rejection lead to introspection and personal growth, illustrating the transformative power of experiences and emotions. These key learning points highlight the psychological depth and thematic richness of The Kiss by Anton Chekhov, offering readers valuable insights into human nature, desire, and the complexities of human relationships. Thank you for listening.